Well, good morning, everybody. Well, the fellows are, many of them are at a men's retreat weekend kind of thing. And so we will continue on, but it's great to see all of you. Praise God, have I got a message for you today. I start that way to explain that this is one that every single person in this room at some level or another has had to deal with and is currently dealing with it. So we're just going to jump right into it. 2 Corinthians is where we're going to be out of. Chapter 2, here's the scenario. As I mentioned, when Paul wrote this letter, he wrote it in such a fashion that he was instructed to open his heart, to share the troubles, the trials, all the things in between. And so he did, so that people could both learn. Our lives are changed. But here's the scenario. There are many in life that ignore troubles or hope that it just goes away all on its own. But we're going to talk today about how to deal with these kinds of things. Now, I did read just recently this little synopsis. There was one person in life who has not had to deal with troubles where he was from. It matters when it comes to perspective. This is what he said. I just left probably 150,000 people who have no problems at all, said the man. But the other fellow turned to him and said, that's great. Take me to them. He said, there's one problem. It was all at a cemetery. I'm going to let that catch up to some of y'all. You see, here's the scenario. You're not going to take your earthly problems when you, with you when you die. When you are a believer in Jesus. When you've given your heart, your mind, your body, when you have rescued, been rescued by Jesus, these earthly things don't follow you along. But problems on this side of eternity come from everywhere. And as believers, you need to understand that God permits these troubles to follow you. It doesn't always mean that you've been the root cause of it. It doesn't mean that you asked for it. But they've come upon you like this and you need to trust. All of this we're going to cover today. But I thought we'd talk about this time of testing. I don't like tests. I don't know if you like tests. Some of you are excellent test takers. You get down, you get your A, you feel so good about yourself. That's not me. And so I did like this one. Their fellow that he was going in to get his ornithology degree. The study of birds. He had a tough professor and when it came time for a test, the professor gave him 25 pictures of birds' feet and said that he had to identify each bird. Now, Without missing a beat, this young fellow looked at his professor and goes, that's impossible. I'm not going to do it. There's no way. The professor said, well, then I'm going to have to fail you. And the guy said, fine, fail me. And so the professor said, what's your name? Well, he took off his shoes and goes, you tell me. <laughs> you, see, I, I don't know if that's an appropriate response, but here's the scenario. Unlike the professor, God knows each and every one of us. He identifies you in all kinds of ways. He made us. He knows our lives. And because of that, He also knows the tests that you're put through. Today we're going to talk about a test that we experience. So would you bow your heads in prayer? We're going to dive into God's Word. Lord, we love You. And we are so thankful for the things You have done in our lives. We are especially thankful that in these times of testing, You carry us, You hold us. And Lord, you provide a way for us to grow close to you. Now, there's some family members that need your help. Some need healing, Lord. And some, they need comfort because of the loss of their loved one. But we ask a blessing on them as only you can provide. And so as we study today, change us. Mold us. And let us be different when we leave. We pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. How's our energy level? We ready? I, I'm, I'm asking for a little bit of it because here's the scenario. Turned a little cold on you this morning, and so i got to make sure we're all warmed up. Cindy did a fantastic job. So here it goes. You ready? Last week we talked about pain. And in that process of pain, we asked questions, but I'm going to ask a different one. How do you respond to troubles? How do you respond to setbacks? You see, emotional pain is indeed different than physical pain. And how you deal with it, especially when it comes from a relationship that you trust, somebody that you care about, or somebody they say that knows you, it can be extremely hard to deal with. 
Many of you understand what it's like to have broken relationships. Either you've been the one that broke it, or they broke it with you. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about an ex, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about a work, a team, whatever it might be, relationships get hurt from time to time. But it begs the question, were you always at fault? Were you never at fault? You see, church, Paul explained in all these types of situations that no matter what the circumstances, no matter what your story is, you see, no matter what, you need to have a clear conscience. If you're at fault, God provides a way for you to be forgiven. If you've been wronged, God provides a way of judgment. And it doesn't happen to you that way. Now I know that this morning, me saying things like that, might not take away the sting of your life. If we could apply the proper ointment, we would never take up an offering in our church. Would you agree with that? People just be walking through, just wanting an ointment. But that's not the way this works. God created us to depend on Him and live for Him. Now, I know that with this pain and sting, you need a little background. One of the members of the church at Corinth that Paul's writing to, they caused Paul a great deal of pain. Now, I'm not sure if this is the same man that was caught in open fornication or not. I'm not sure that if it was somebody who questioned maybe his leadership or style or whatever it was, but whoever it was, Paul was hurt by it. And you can all relate to being hurt. Pain was caused in your lives and you need to deal with it somehow. But for Paul, he decided not to give pain the power in his life. He decided not to give Satan a foothold in his life. Rather, instead, he decided to trust the Lord. And so last week, this is the scripture I read in verse 1 out of chapter 2. I determined this within myself, that I would not come again to you in sorrow. For if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad, but the one that was made sorrowful by me? I mentioned as a point that a Christian can determine their attitude and their actions. And boy, did I hear from some of you. Did you know that there is an exception to every rule of thumb? Did you know that? Let me address it if you don't mind. This is a hard challenge to our faith. This is a hard challenge. And I know that even today somebody's watching on the screen that would like to throw an exception to the rule of God. But you need to understand something. You're right. We don't know what you went through. You don't know, right? You're about to say, who I'm married to. You don't know who I work with or who's at school or a team. But you see, church, even though we don't know all these things, God does. And what He explains is that if every time I see you, you're in a perpetual state of grief, then you're going to begin thinking that 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 is all a Christian is capable of. Well, you know such and such. Every time I see them, they're just a sad individual. They're just a grieving individual. Maybe I'm not doing something right. Maybe I need to put a grief on my face. Could you imagine coming to church this morning? Could you imagine if I stood up on stage and maybe instead of smiling, I just looked at everybody like I do sometimes my family? Hold on, I'm not there yet. I got to generate it. Sometimes our family pushes our buttons so much that in a replace of anger, we just get full of grief. But Paul said that if every time I see you, I depress you, I bring you down, then you won't be able to bring me up. And we need help to bring each other up. But understand what also Paul was saying, is that if every time you see me, I'm in a perpetual state of grief, you're going to end up starting where you're just going to run from me. And you won't be around me any longer. And there's many a person who has a testimony that they feel all alone. Maybe the reason they feel all alone is because they've pushed everybody away. Now, Paul says, from right here and now, I'm deciding that when you see me, I'm not going to be full of grief. That doesn't mean that I'm going to be fake or mask it. What he says in verse 3 is, I wrote to you this very thing. Lest when I came to you, I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy. Having confidence in you that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love 
which I have so abundantly for you. As a Christian, he said, my joy, my love is found in you all, the church. There's no better way to pronounce it, to see how the love of God is growing in somebody's life with how much they love the church. It's interesting when people tell me left and right in time where they go, oh, I love the Lord with all my heart. I just don't ever have to be around Christians. Well, that doesn't make any sense at all. That'd be like me coming to church going, I am a happy married man. I ain't seen my wife in 20 years. Now, don't y'all dare make a comment on that. But Paul is saying, we don't need to be fake. We don't need to mask our emotions. But remember where your joy and your love comes from. First, it comes from the Lord. But then it is poured out and blossomed around the church. The truth is, the more we're around the church, we ought to be encouraged and strengthened as well as convicted, as well as repentant individuals. We ought to be people full of love when we see each other. Now, i got to tell you, our goal should always be to strive for unity. Unity in our marriages, friendships, work relations, teams, schools, whatever it might be. But especially in the church, especially here. So it begs the question, how pleasant is your home? If it isn't good, does one of you need to adjust your attitude? I agree that it takes two to tango. So perhaps before you decide today to throw your spouse under the bus as we continue, or to poke the rib and go, he is preaching at you right now, before you do that, let me make this challenge. Make sure that your heart this morning is the one that's full of joy. Make sure that your heart is the one that is giving comfort and love and the rest, as you will see. Remember, a gift can be offered. But if it's not received, there's been no acceptance. Remember this morning that those whom you depend on the most within the church, your home and the like, they can be the ones that disappoint you the greatest. Paul wrote out a heartache. But in that hurt, he was able to express how much he truly cared for that individual. You do understand that, don't you, church? That part of the reason you hurt is because of the disappointment of the one who caused it. You cared for them deeply. And that's where this root comes from. So at this point, many of you are saying, okay, I get it from last week to now. I'll try my best. I'll try my best not to make other people sad. You'll say to yourself, I'll try to remember how much I love people. Even the person that hurt me, God bless his soul. Or it could be God bless her soul too, right everybody? But I'm still hurting. I'm not better. In fact, truth is, if I'm really honest, I'd like that person to know how much they've hurt me. And this is where we pick up in verse 5. Would you look at it? But if anyone has caused grief, he's not grieved me, but all of you to some extent, not to be too severe. This punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, it's sufficient for such a man, so that, on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such as one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to Him. Allow me to say this morning, enough is enough. This is what Paul is saying. Punishment is easy. It's easy to apply punishment. But what's hard is to forgive and comfort. That is someone who is godly. That is someone who offers that is a godly individual. Right, church, you ready? The Bible says that if you keep punishing the one that wronged you, that did you in, that hurt your feelings, that did whatever they did to you, whatever it might be, you need to understand this. You're the one who's going to keep yourself in sorrow. When you apply the punishment ongoing, you're the one who will be perpetual in a state of sorrow, but to forgive and comfort someone, that's the godly challenge. It's easy to punish now, you're probably saying, but you don't know what they did. You're right. And I'm certain that some of you will text me, call me, and write me. You're right. 
I don't know what they did. And I don't know what they said. But it is true. They could have stolen something from you. They could have said unbelievable things that hurt you and your reputation, your job. In fact, they could have even killed something you care about. I know it could be a spouse, an ex, a grandchild, a child. You're right. But i got to ask, what's it going to take for you today to stop punishing the one that did you wrong? What's it going to take? Is that a question you're willing to answer? Is that a question you're willing to address? I mean, did you decide when they wronged you at some level, did you decide to give them a life sentence of filled with Dirty looks, ignoring moments, hurtful words from you. And when they hurt you, did you decide that for the rest of your life, you know what I'm going to do? I want them to be as miserable as they've made me, and it's on now. It could be family, it could be friends, and in between. But do you really have the energy to commit to that kind of life forever? Because one thing I have noticed, that the older I get, the less energy that comes in a repetitive cycle. And some of you today are looking at me going, yeah, but you're so young. That ought to show you how exhausting life could be. I'm only 21. (laughs) Alright, that's not true. Don't you see? This is the question you have to ask. Is Do you have the kind of energy to punish somebody for a life like that? Have you made a commitment to reject them? Have you made a commitment to make them suffer? Have you really looked at the commitment that you're making? Because you see, church, what Satan doesn't want you to understand or want you to see is the bondage that you've put yourself in trying to punish someone else for something they've said or something they have did to you. Whatever it might be. And so you have to ask yourself, instead of saying, how can I hurt them the way they hurt me? What you need to ask is, how can I stop punishing someone forever? How can I stop punishing this individual when in reality they're not even in my life? In fact, some of you, you have made a commitment to punish that individual. You haven't seen them in 10 years, but you're going to go to a high school reunion. You're going to go to a workplace moment. You're going to go back and as soon as you see them right then and there, you just flash right back and all that rage or anger or bitterness or frustration just comes zapping back on you. You didn't even ask for it. It just popped in. And so the Bible says that the only way that you can move on in your life is by placing your trust in the Lord and not in the punishments that you want to delve out. You see, we have to follow Christ in obedience by forgiving the one who offended us so greatly. And right now, many of you are going, well, I forgive, I forgive. I'm just not going to forget. I forgive them. Yep. When I see them, I can even force a smile on. I forgive them. I'll just never forget what they did, right? How are we doing so far? Can you all at least nod on me, make sure we're all tracking? Okay. We need to ask, how did Paul manage to forgive? Paul talked about love. We do that a lot. We talk about the love of God, the love of one another. I think we mention it often and we think about it in terms of how much God loves us. We mention it in the way in which we love and care for one another. We want to take care of one another. But in reality, this is what Paul said, that we ought to reaffirm the love that we had for this person. And this is the same message that I've come to deliver to all of us today. It's time for us to reaffirm the love that we had for that individual that caused you pain. To reaffirm does not mean to recommit. Some of you through life, you have recommitted your life to the Lord a hundred times. You've recommitted your marriage to one another a hundred times. But this is not what Paul mentions. This is not a recommitment issue. This is, I had a love for that individual. This is not new. It's not something I'm going to fake. I'm just going to remember how I used to care for this individual. Whatever it might be. Don't be fake. But reaffirm. Some of you are the best Actor and actresses that has ever been invented despite what Hollywood produces. You have walked into churches 
Walmart and all the places in between. And when you see the one that you would like to suffer, you look right at them and go, Hi, how are you? It's good to see you. We lied to them right then. It wasn't good to see them, but you didn't know what else to say, did you? Or you go, I hope you have a great day. What you really mean is I hope you have a flat tire and get thrown into a muddy ditch. Am I wrong? Don't be fake, Paul says. And But instead of wishing them the evil, the energy that it takes to wish someone a horrendous day, instead, pour yourself into the love of God and say, this is the reaffirmation that God, without your help, I can't love them at all. Because they drive me crazy. See, to reaffirm love is you're remembering the love of God in your life. Of what He gave you. Have you ever taken stock to think about all the things that you've ever been forgiven of? I did that and it broke me. I've done that. It hurts me. Not because I'm still carrying away the, the, the guilt or shame. But it's the hurt of how could I be so crazy to have done those kinds of things when God loves me so much. And when you carry around that kind of punishment, when you carry around that kind of stuff for somebody who's done you wrong, you can imagine the amount of energy and focus and dedication. What if you applied that to other areas of your life instead of being so passionate about ruining their life? You became passionate about God and telling everybody what He's done for you. Could you imagine the amount of energy you would have to serve instead of to punish? And so what Paul says is that love it helps others grow. It seeks them out. Some of you have been wounded by someone so much that the only recourse you have this morning is you just want everybody to know how bad you have it. Now let me give you something innocent. Ready? You go and you try a new restaurant. And the service was awful. Food was terrible. And if somebody asks you about that place, what do you do? You'll try to be really sweet about it and you'll go, hey, you're welcome to go if you want. But I wouldn't go there again if you paid for my meal. Why? Why is that so? And you would tell them. Now, I know that in our church world, we'll lie about how we feel, but we never lie about others, right? I mean, none of you would ever embellish how bad that restaurant experience was, would you? Never in this room. I hope that the sarcasm is coming through. I can't quite tell if it's coming through. Because here's why. One thing I notice is that when it comes to pain from people, sometimes my stories have a tendency to grow based on what somebody may or may not have said or done or did not do. And one of the worst things you can do is start explaining to everybody how you've been wronged by all these individuals in life because I'm willing to stake a slice of cheesecake that says you won't actually tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. You might put a little barbecue sauce on it. Not the cheesecake. All right, you ready? Paul wrote this letter. And in writing this letter, you notice that Paul never mentioned who did him in. He never told the name of the individual who did him in, although there have been moments. And see, what happens is, he never explained how this person had divided the church family, but Paul did explain that they needed to discipline this individual to bring him back for his own good. And you're probably thinking, well, what's the difference? I mean, the truth is, this is the church at Corinth. It's probably small enough that everybody knows what everybody did. Like Lloyd, for instance. Can somebody do something in this town that nobody knows about? Everybody will know about it. Would you not agree? And so you're thinking, well, then of course he didn't mention the name. He didn't have to. But you see what he was doing is, he was addressing the sin, not the sinner. And that ought to keep us in the right frame of mind when we have an aggravation about it, people. If they've said something about you, if they've done you wrong, address the sin. Address the issue as a hand and go, hey, we need to deal with this. We need to fix this. We need forgiveness and grace. And so if a person is the person who had this 
fornication in his life, you need to know what happened. As Paul told him that the church ought to hold a meeting, they ought to discipline the man, and that here's what happened. He repented of his sins. He was restored into the family of God. That's a praise the God moment in our lives. That's praise Lord. And so one thing we ought to live by is that we ought to never be the kind of Christians or the kind of church for that matter who act as the gotcha Christians. We're not the religious police. But it's easy for us to get into that role. We're driving down the road. We're in a store. Maybe in our home. It is easy to point out every flaw and every issue. And it is easy to punish all that we meet. Because we want to correct them through a heavy rod. Don't we? But you see, what we need to do is to forgive and to comfort as we apply discipline. Discipline for the believer, it's actually to our own good. I know that it's less about what the person did and it's supposed to be about the change of life that's supposed to happen. See, true discipline is evidence of the love of God and the love of one another in each other's life. I don't know if you look at that that way. I know that there's some families out there that don't believe in discipline. Um, Jenny likes to show me these funny videos where... Parents don't ever like to tell their children no, so they say other words than no. I didn't know there were other words than no. I just thought no was easy. I can spell that one, right, everybody? But in reality, there are some families who don't ever like the discipline, but they want their children to figure it out on their own. I tend to learn all my lessons the hard way. And I think some of you can relate And if my parents, my coaches, and my teachers, if they had let me learn every single lesson the hard way, do you know what I would be doing today probably? Is I would have a number right by my shoulder turned sideways. Because myself, if there's a wrong to do, I probably would have tried it. But instead, I was disciplined, corrected. Little story within a story. Nobody ever had to tell me how to lie. I learned it all on my own. I've shared this before, but in case some of you are new and haven't heard it, when I was a young child, I was allowed one dessert, one, every now and again. My mama's watching, so I have to tell the truth. Y'all like that, don't you? What happened was I reached in the freezer, and I would get a dessert, and I would bring it to a family member. If they didn't want it, do you know what they would normally say? Oh, you can have it. So if asked, I would say, no, this is not my dessert. This is daddy's. Although I got to enjoy it. So one day, it made sense to cut out the middleman. So I went in the freezer. I grabbed two desserts with the rationale that dad would give me his and I could have my own. It's a fair warning. So when they came home, found me with two desserts. You know what they asked, don't you? What are you doing with two desserts? After I had them, I pulled it up to my dad and said, this one's yours. He looked right at me, and you realize what happened next, don't you, ladies and gentlemen? Spankings. That was my parents' favorite term. Discipline. Correction. But nothing be taking away my dessert. You see, I needed to be fixed. I needed to learn how not to lie, not to deceive, not to coerce things my way. You see... If you really love children, if you really love your family members, you would discipline them. Now, how can I say that? Because if someone doesn't know how, that they've sinned, how can they ask for forgiveness? But what we need to do is do it differently. We need to present the Word of God to each and every person. And we need to show them that sin doesn't need to be their future, but that Jesus is their future. Our hope and our prayer is that when every person hears the Word of God, that they will realize what they have done and they can get right with Jesus, that they can be forgiven and that they can move on. It's the same people that we care about. In fact, truth be told, Paul mentions that we ought to treat the church with this kind of love, not just the stranger, not just the first-time visitor. Listen, I know family. That when it comes to discipline among the family or even in the church, that there are so many families that sweep things under the rug. They hope by ignoring them just long enough that the monster in the room will leave. 
There's too many churches that sweep things under the rug instead of obeying the scriptures or confronting the situation boldly by speaking truth in love. But for those who are uncomfortable with this subject this morning, and, and the reason you're uncomfortable is because you have suffered under abuse in your past, I would like to tell you that I'm sorry. Because abuse is not discipline. Those are not the same. And for some of you today, please understand that abuse should never be tolerated. That because of what you went through, God promises to help you, to encourage you, to strengthen you, to heal you. But that the abuser will be faced with judgment. Now that's a lesson for a different time. So I'll just move on to say that punishment is easy. And because we're supposed to be different than that, the risk is you could punish too long and too severe. God says you need to live in forgiveness and in comfort. This next part is critical. That once the lesson has been taught, Paul says, that once it's been taught, once it's been learned, it's time to move on. We discipline so that people won't sin in that area any longer. So that their life can get back to the path of righteousness. And so this morning, I need to challenge you. Don't just stay in the discipline camp. Don't walk around and point out every wrong that's ever happened under the sun and how the world needs to be fixed and your family needs to get fixed and world needs to get fixed and how everything is wrong around you. If you stay in that camp, you'll never be filled with the joy that is supposed to be available for you as a believer. You're supposed to live in the forgiveness. You're supposed to live in the comfort camp. Help everybody. Help everybody understand that there is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. He has given it richly. He has given it plentiful. And so it is available for you today. Help them to understand that. But now it's time for you to live in the comfort of Jesus. And tell them, neither you or their past has to follow them for the rest of their life. The reason people punish people so frequently in life is they cannot seem to move on and they keep carrying their past everywhere they go. I've come to deliver this message to you that you, ladies and gentlemen, the punishers, you don't have to allow your past to follow you every time you see them. As we head into our last point, I know that some of you don't like confrontation. Even right here and right now, you're sitting here going, oh, please. I don't want to confront. I don't want to be confronted. I just want it to go away. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says that peace at any price is not godly. And that includes ignoring it. You can't do it. You cannot have spiritual peace without the purity of God, and that means forgiveness. And if you go sweeping it on the rug, if you ignore it, if you allow the lack of confrontation in your life to do, all it's going to do is fester, it's going to get bigger, and at some point it's going to explode, and you probably won't like how it comes out. Problems that are swept under the rug have a way of growing and growing and even worse it gets. So listen folks. As bad as it is. To take your bad mood with you wherever you go. Acting like nothing bothers you. Putting on a fake face. Or ignoring somebody perpetually. And punishing them forever. It's just as bad. You see that don't you? Well this man whom Paul confronted. The church disciplined. He was helped. He was strengthened. He was encouraged. He was changed. I know that when you were a child, you probably didn't always appreciate your parents, teachers, coaches, discipline. But truly, as you've gotten older, you've begun to understand how much they cared and how much when they would say, this hurts me more than it hurts you. For some of you, you're actually learning that lesson. So now we get to the test portion. In verse 9, this is the test to see whether you actually forgave the individual. So for those of you this morning who say, I forgave them, I'm just not going to forget, listen up. 
In verse 9 it says, For to this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. Now, whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Let Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Last point. It's a big one, but it's the last one, is Christians get tested in their faith. That's how you know it's real. You get tested. You see, church, this isn't a test to see if you're going to follow God's commandments. This isn't a test to see if you're a good church member. This is a test of one of the hardest issues in a believer's life that anyone who has ever been hurt for somebody that cared about them, or at least they said they did, they hurt you, they wounded you, whatever it might have been, you would probably have the testimony, this is the hardest thing to get over in my life. They said they loved me forever. They lied. They said we'd know each other this way. They lied. They said some things. They did some things. They hurt me and I'm having a hard time getting through this. Paul says that you are being tested by God in the area of forgiveness. And so we often talk about how God tests us. I preached a message before that, James 1, and he says in verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Everybody in this room, uh, they would stand up and say, well, don't pray for patience. But in this room, you know what every one of you ought to do? Is I'm getting better and better at patience because I've been tested left and right by family and friends and work and the church. We all ought to have the testimony. Hi, my name's Jared. I just want to let you know that my patience has grown from a negative 40 to a 2. Praise God. And somebody ought to go, well, how'd you get there? Have you seen my family? They are good people. And God uses them to test me. Have you seen my church? They're good people. But God uses them to test me. My job. And you can go on and on and on. On instead of being afraid of developing a deeper patience in life, we need to embrace the fact that God cares enough about you to produce it in our lives. And so this is what God's Word says. As God told Paul to write to the church on how they needed to conduct themselves at Corinth, We're no different. This is how we ought to be acting. And so God instructs you that you need to be holy. You need to be righteous. And that you are responsible for how you will respond to the testing of God that He is putting you through. It's your job to decide on how you're going to respond. So if you're mad at God, we need to deal with that. If you're going to punish your family, your friends, your church, whoever it might be, if you're going to punish them forever, it's time to deal with that because you need to know you're failing the test. There is the same point over and over again is that a Christian can determine how they respond to the testing. So what's our test? Obedience. Boy, that's a simple test, isn't it? Some of you today, if I ask the question, are you obedient in all things? Some of you would start chuckling right now, right now when you go, and you'd say with a little sly thing, well, I mean, not all things, right? But then some of you, if I ask you, are you obedient in all things? Right away, right away you feel condemned. Right away you feel hurt and under the bondage of things and go, what are you trying to do to me? Some of you are your own worst critics, aren't you? Everything I do is wrong. Everywhere I go is wrong. And in case you don't feel wrong, you've got people in your life that remind you how wrong you are, don't you? And so because of that, right now you feel this. But if I could encourage you in some way, in some form, in some fashion, being obedient is not humorous. Being obedient is not condemnation. Jesus said out of John 3, 17, He didn't come to this world to condemn the world, but that through Him it may be saved. And so understand this morning that as you remind yourself and others how much you might despise tests, 
if you feel like you're going to fail the test that God's going to put you in, before you spiral out of control, let me remind you that what the Word of God says is that we're offered test after test after test to show that only by depending on God can we pass it all. I am not an obedient person. I really like to do Jared's will. It comes natural to me. But to be obedient means that I have to make a conscious decision to do what God wants me to do instead of what Jared wants. That I actually have to decide both in mind and heart that, okay, God, I'm going to be obedient. But then some of you like to punish God for your obedience. You were obedient and things did not go according to Jared or your plan, did it? But what does this word God say? It says you need to be obedient in all things. It doesn't matter whether it's your will or mine. That's not what this is about. And so we are given the opportunity to repent and to be forgiven for every test that we've ever failed. We've been given the opportunity to be forgiven and to live with that forgiveness and comfort every time we knowingly broke what God wanted us to do. Don't you see? This is what's so powerful. I'm not a very good student, although I like to study. Some of you, you just were great students. You passed everything without even trying, didn't you? But some of you know what it's like to be a, a student that learns the hard way. Could you imagine if your teacher came to you at every single test, at every single paper, at every single moment in life, and stood right beside you, not over you, but right beside you, and said, okay, that's the wrong answer. Now, here's the good news. If you tell me you're sorry, we're going to give you another shot. i got to tell you, I think I could have made straight A's that way. I think I could have done it. I think I could have. But don't you see, this is the beauty of parts of the gospel that is there. Is that every test you're in, you've got to give it a try. You've got to be obedient in all things. If you're not, ask forgiveness and then move on. Don't settle for the punishment camp. And that includes you. Some of you, you wouldn't punish anybody else. But you punish you so much, nobody has to say anything bad about you at all. You're your own worst critic. You're your own worst enemy. And instead of living in the forgiveness that God has given each and every one of us, what you have done to yourself is you've robbed yourself of the joy and the comfort and the forgiveness of God Almighty. And so what Paul says as he wrote is, hold on, time out. You ready? Let's talk about forgiveness. The worst individual in life can be forgiven. Whatever that worst individual is to you can be forgiven. And this is what Paul said as he addressed it. You ready? There was a a person who committed many a crime. They had taken a life. They were a despicable individual. And when their family was invited to see the execution that they were about to experience, the family was interviewed by a paper and they said, "Do do you really care about this person who's going to be killed for their crimes? You know what the family said? We care about them. We know what they did was wrong. We know that they hurt us. We just want them to know that He's forgiven. And so here's what Paul would say. Is if there's somebody who can forgive that person for whatever they did... Do you not understand that God loves you that much more? That He will forgive you if asked? That He is the greatest. He is the one who forgave all things if asked. And so this is Paul's point. Is that if this person can be forgiven by you, then I need to learn how to forgive too. So here's how it close. Paul urged the church. He urged the family. It's time. 
If you say that you have love in your heart, what you need to know is that love forgives and it encourages. It doesn't punish. If they're going to forgive him for what they did, then Paul's going to too. And this comes from us, one another. Are you withholding forgiveness for a family member? A friend? Somebody at church? Paul says, if they can be forgiven by Jesus, then you can be forgiven by Jesus and you can forgive them. Paul isn't saying that this man who did wrong must forgive himself first. Don't listen to the world's definition that I need to forgive me. I don't need to forgive me for nothing. What I do need is I need the forgiveness of Jesus and I need the forgiveness of the one who wronged me. And now I need to act like I've been forgiven. God is in the testing business. And He tests the one who's been forgiven. And He tests the one who is doing the forgiven. God tests you. And so how do you know that if you have actually forgiven the one who has wronged you? It's when the church decides and assures a forgiven brother or sister that the sin has been forgiven. Is that you? Did you wrong somebody so poorly? And so when you go around them, you kind of act like a, a sad individual. You know, I keep doing wrong and I'm, I'm still doing wrong. I, I don't mean to do wrong. I'm, I'm, I relapse and I do all these things. Hey, do you have friends? Do you have family members? Do they come to you and say, hey, Jesus loves you. He forgives you. But do you still walk around and go, I'm wrong, I relapse, I do everything wrong, I just don't do all this stuff. Listen, you're punishing yourself and it's time to move on. And in just a moment, we're going to sing a song. And it's time for you to wake into the reality of forgiveness. Now, for those of you who want to test to see if you've actually forgiven, it's time to say what you mean and mean what you say. You ever heard that? It's time to put your <clears throat> money where your mouth is. It's time to go to that individual. It's time to look them in the eye. It's time to dust the old rug that you've been sweeping everything under. You see, every parent who disciplines a child must follow this discipline with the assurance of love and forgiveness. Or do you know that the discipline will actually do more harm than good? If you've actually forgiven the one that you repeatedly say, I forgive them, I forgive them, I forgive them, it has nothing to do whether they've earned it. It has everything to do with being obedient in all things. Oh, how easy it would be to preach a message this morning by saying, oh, as long as we don't say bad words, we all need to obey the speed limit. We all need to just not lie this morning. Boy, that'd be an easy message. Everybody in this room would go, I agree, we just need to do those good things and, and we'll be fine. Instead, I've come to deliver this message. You ready? You must be obedient in all things. And lack of forgiveness is no excuse for the hurt you've endured. You're not going to stand before Jesus in which your life is unfolded before Him. And He goes, I'm really glad you decided to punish such and such for the 37 years remaining on their life. That will never happen out of Jesus' mouth. There's never going to be a moment where an angel comes up next to you, pokes you in the ribs and goes, hey, we were rooting for you. Way to go. No, rather when you get there, you're going to realize, oh, why did I carry this my whole life? I just didn't have the energy for it. Paul said, if you can forgive, I can forgive too. But the last reason that he gave for forgiveness is you don't realize what the devil's doing to you. You don't know what the devil's capable of, do you? We do know this. He's here to steal. He's here to kill. And he sure likes to destroy don't you know that includes you? My last story within the story. My brother wanting to teach me a lesson. 
um, he was a sheriff's deputy. He decided that it would benefit me greatly if he would put me behind bars just a few hours just to kind of prove a point that I didn't want that to be my direction in life. I don't know about you, but I don't really like prison. It's not a real enjoyable place. When those doors slammed shut, all I thought is, never in my life do I want to be back here. Ever. Ever. I mention that only to explain something that what you don't understand is that by withholding forgiveness from someone, withholding comfort from someone, by deciding to punish them for life, you have allowed yourself to be in a created, satanic prison. Because that's all you'll think. Every time I see them, I have to punish them. Every time I'm around them, I have to hurt them. Every time I see them, I want them to hurt just as much as me. It's time to get out of prison. Jesus holds the key. He holds the deliverance from it. But you have to want it. And so as we sing this song, it's customary for me to say that if any of you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, this cross that we have behind us, this is what it represents. Jesus willingly gave His life on the cross for you and for me. And not just so that you could have forgiveness for all these big sins, but sin for everything. And that includes, even as you say right here and now, I've been a believer most all my life. Well, He's here to forgive your lack of obedience and He's here to forgive you for not forgiving. But this morning as we sing this song, this altar is open. And so maybe you want to come up here and say, okay, here's the deal. I've got a lot of anger in my life. I've got a lot of frustration in my life. I've got a lot of hurt in my life. And I really... I really want things to change. And so this morning, this altar is open. I'm up here if you want to come and talk and pray. I'm here to help you understand that it's time to be obedient. And that means to offer forgiveness. So right here and now, if you leave this place with that same anger, that same frustration, that same lack of forgiveness in your heart, you need to understand that you're making a decision not to obey. And that, God will not force you to be obedient. Right here and now. This is the new beginning of life. It's time to accept the forgiveness that God has given you. Will you join me in that? Will you join me in being brand new in that area? Would you reaffirm the love that you have for your family members? The one who's sitting next to you, the one at home, the one down the road, the one a state away. Would you reach out to them today and say, today, I just want to let you know, I had this message I heard about the reaffirmation of love and I just want to tell you I love you. Don't dig. Don't hurt. Don't wound them. Just let the love of God Come through you. Would you join me in that today? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we love you. And you've made us brand new over and over and over again. And we are thankful for every moment of forgiveness. Our salvation secure in you. But that daily life, help us to lay it down for your grace. And so God, deal with our hearts and our minds right here and now. Let us be different in you. We pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen.